Okay, so today we are talking about how to develop children's understanding of the different types of science inquiry. Um, if you were here for the session last week, we did talk about um, the science inquiry process and we talked through this, um, this cycle here, particularly thinking about questions. So that is the inquiry process. It's children ask, asking questions and answering them using um, practical means where possible. Um, just need to think about where this fits in with the national curriculum. So in year one and year two, in the working scientifically, um, there's a statement, as you can see in the green here, asking simple questions and recognising that they can be answered in different ways. It doesn't explicitly say in the um, statement what those different ways are, but throughout the national curriculum, there are five types of inquiry um, mentioned throughout. And so I believe that those answered in different ways is referring to those different types of inquiry. This particular um, document is from the plan working scientifically matrices. Um, if you would like, if you haven't, you're not familiar with them, you can get these slides from us later and you'll be able to click through and find these documents in the link at the bottom of the screen there. Um, so the national curriculum statement is in green and these bullet points are additional bits of advice as to what that statement means. So then looking through into year three and year four, again, we've got a statement about asking questions. And here it does mention using different types of scientific inquiry to ask them answer them and then in year five and year six similarly a statement about planning different types of science inquiry to answer questions so this idea of using science inquiry is firmly embedded within the national curriculum so what are those five types of science inquiry i'm not going to ask you to name them right now because um, i'm going to go through them um, very quickly and then we're going to have a quick quiz with them What's really important is that the, firstly, the teachers need to have a good understanding of them. So I'm just going to go through them now very quickly for you. So these are the five types of scientific inquiry that are in our national curriculum. There are other types of science inquiry that we don't include or are not included in our national curriculum. And then there are also other practical activities that you would be doing in your class, which are totally valid, but wouldn't be classed as inquiry because there isn't necessarily a question that the children are, are answering. So that would be things like exploring or making models, that sort of thing. Um, so the different types of inquiry we've got, just starting with the observ observing over time, this is watching to see how something changes over a period of time. It could be over a couple of minutes, it could be over a couple of hours, over days, weeks, or even over the year, particularly with seasonal change. Um, so this could be looking to see how plants change, uh, looking to see how ice cubes change, temperature of water over a period of time. Then we have our comparative and fair testing. So this is where we are changing one thing, deliberately choosing and changing one thing, and then seeing what effect it has on something else. So we're changing one variable and seeing what it does to another variable, which we're either just looking at and observing or we could be measuring. The national curriculum talks about comparative and fair testing. And I think, again, it's useful for teachers to have a definition for these that they're um, using. Um, so a comparative test is where the variable that you're changing is something that is in words. So we're changing something like the type of material or it's a big thing, a small thing. It's um, the shape of something. So we're changing a qualitative thing. Um, and then the data would be presented as a bar chart. Whereas a fair test, we are changing something in a quantitative fashion. Um, so we're changing the size of something um, and therefore the data would end up being presented as a line graph. So I think it's useful for teachers to know that difference. Um, whether children need to know or not, I think is down to you to make that decision. Um, then we come on to classifying. Classifying will often involve a simple test, um, but it's basically a simple test that will give an answer yes or no. So are these materials magnetic? The answer will be yes or no. And then pattern seeking is when we're looking for links between two variables, but where we're not expecting one to be causing the change on something else. It's just that things are the way they are because the way they are. Um, and they will often be um, things associated with living things. 
And then finally, researching is included as a type of inquiry in the national curriculum. Although if you were to look it up in a dictionary definition, dictionary definition of science inquiry is that the questions are answered through practical means. So that wouldn't really include researching in the way that we do our research. But sometimes questions will come up that are not possible to be answered by first-hand experiences. And so in these situations, we need the children to look them up somehow. That may be um, looking them up on the internet, looking them up in books. It may be asking an expert as well. So those are our types of inquiry, which hopefully you're all very familiar with. So we're gonna have a quick quiz about which type of inquiry would the children be using? And do think about children answering these questions. How would children answer each of these questions? Voted. It's either one person has voted or we have all decided that it is research. Um, and I totally agree um, that it would be quite difficult for children, certainly, to um, do this in any other way. Um, obviously, somebody with some medical qualifications could put um, some sort of dye in the blood and do an observation over time, but we would have to look it up in a book. Um, so moving on to the next question, how does the size of a parachute affect the time it takes to fall? Okay, so do keep voting if you haven't managed to quite flick your answer in. Um, but again, the vast majority have gone for um, a comparative or fair test. Um, there was a little, little spike about observing over time. Yes, we are taking a time measurement, but that's the way that we're um, finding out what happened. Um, so it's the variable we're measuring. Um, comparative or fair test would be depending on how we're qualifying size. If we're saying it's a big parachute and a medium sized parachute and a small parachute, it would be a comparative test. If we're doing it by the actual area measurement, that would be numbers and it would be a fair test. Moving on to our next question. How far is the Earth from the sun? OK, so I was trying to trick you. Um, we'd already had one researching, but I've thrown another researching one there. But you're not you're too clear, clever for that. You're not going to be fooled. Um, yes, we would need to find that out by researching. Moving on to the next one. Do bigger birds lay larger eggs? OK, so the majority of you have gone for pattern seeking, and I would, would agree with you with that, that what we're doing is we're seeing if there is a link between the size of the bird and the size of their eggs. And that may be, may be a pattern there or there may not be. Um, I can see why you're saying researching that actually for the children in the class, they would need that information. They wouldn't know the size of birds and the size of the legs, eggs. So they'd need to do some research. And then from that research, they would be looking for the um, pattern, the pattern between those things. So I can see that in this case, the research would lead into the answering the question using pattern seeking. Um, I'm not sure where the observing over time came from. So if somebody would like to chip in with your thinking on that, then please feel free to add that to the chat. I'm not discounting it. I'm just at the moment, I'm not seeing not seeing the way that we'd be doing it that way. But if you would like to chip in, then that's fine. Next question, where do snails live? Okay, so we've got an interesting spread there. Um, and I think I'll just talk through my, my thoughts around why people have opted for these different types of inquiry. Um, so we could observe over time, if I somehow managed to find a snail, and I then followed where it went throughout the day, um, probably where it spends the most amount of time, that's where it chooses to live. Um, pattern seeking, pattern seeking can also be thought about as doing a survey. So I could actually go out and do a survey and find where the snails are, where I'm finding all the different snails, which areas have more or less snails. Again, where there tends to be more snails, I would then assume that's where the snails tend to live. Um, we could look it up in a book. Um, so yes, researching would be an appropriate way as well. Um, classifying, I'm pausing because I'm thinking. Again, I'm not seeing a direct link, although classifying is often associated with identifying. Um, and of course you would need to have identified what a snail is. Um, I must, I'm going to think about that one. If anybody would like to chip in with the, how that's cl classifying, then please do put that onto the chat. The ones that were obvious to me were the pattern seeking, observing over time and researching. And 
Next one, which materials are suitable to use for a raincoat? I think those two answers that you've put there, um, I would agree with both of those. It will depend on how the children are actually doing the inquiry. Um, so if, um, if they were doing it, so basically they're testing for waterproofness. Um, if they were just testing it and saying, this is waterproof, this is not waterproof, so it's either waterproof or it isn't, it's a yes or no, then they would be classifying. If they are testing it in some way and putting them in order from the most waterproof to the least waterproof, then that would be a comparative test because they're changing the type of material, so that's in words, um, so that would be a comparative test rather than a fair test. Okay, and I do believe this is our last one. Okay, so this is an interesting one again. Um, and it depends on how you think about it. But basically, we are changing a variable, we're changing the amount of light, and we're seeing what effect that has on how the fast the bean plant grows. Um, so it is a we are looking for cause and effect. So it is really a comparative or fair test depending on whether we're looking at the amount of light measuring in lux or whether we're just saying it's bright or dim would make the difference between the comparative and the fair test. Again, it's that confusion. We do happen to be making observations over a period of time, but actually that's the way that we're gathering the data as opposed to being the type of inquiry. An, observa an observation over time is very much more about looking at one thing and seeing how that changes. Whereas here, we're definitely doing a cause and effect. However, we are now getting into quite um, pedantic differences between these things. Um, so whilst it's useful for us to have this type of discussion, um, if the children were to say they're doing a comparative or an observation over time, I think the more important thing is that they know how they're doing it. That's the important thing. Okay, um, I'm just going to flick back to my presentation and I did get some clarification from um, Sarah online, thank you very much, um, who was saying that classificate, the classification for the snail, that's what I was um, unsure about at the time, that um, what Sarah was saying, that actually different snails will live in different places, so therefore we could classify the snails according to where they live because um, different types of snails will live in different places. So thank you, Sarah, for that clarification. I hadn't thought about it in that way before. Okay, so it's important that teachers have a good understanding of these different types of inquiry so that, um, so that basically we can plan to make sure that throughout the year, the children are getting a good diet of all these different types of inquiry. Um, so teachers do need to understand them. Um, but I don't think the children need to understand them in exactly the same way as we've just done today. Although with your year five and year sixes, it might be appropriate for doing a quick quiz, this sort of thing. Um, but the children need to be familiar with each type of approach. So they need to have carried out these different types of inquiry so that they know how to do them for themselves. Um, they should then be able to start thinking about choosing which approach they're going to use to answer the, the questions that they've got, the specific question they've got. And they, it's therefore useful for them to just to be able to talk about it, if nothing else, that they can actually name each approach. So they will start going, I'm going to watch it over a period of time. I'm going to be doing an observation over time. I don't think it's necessary for the children to be able to define each inquiry type in exactly the same way that I've just done. Um, so basically, really, by the end of Key Stage 2, uh, the children should be choosing the appropriate type of inquiry to answer their question. That's what was stated in the national curriculum. Therefore, they do need to know what those types of inquiry are so they can actually then select the one that's most appropriate. Um, in order to be able to do that, I would suggest that by the end of Lower Key Stage 2, as the children are doing their inquiry, they should be able to tell you and name the type of inquiry that they're using. By the end of key stage one, if that's gonna happen in key stage two, by the end of key stage one, I would suggest that with the support of the teacher, after they've carried out an inquiry, they should then be able to name which type of inquiry it was that they were doing. So just to make sure that they're really able to do that, it's important that this language, that the, the, they're familiar with the language, so they're familiar with the vocabulary associated with the different types of inquiry. 
and then they can link that vocabulary fair test comparative test with the actual activities that they've been doing so the way that teachers can really support with this is by actually explicitly mentioning and naming the types of inquiry during lessons possibly displaying um, the icons of the different types of inquiry and those icons that i showed you earlier can be downloaded from the um, Siri website. The link is on the slides and we'll give you the um, email address to get for the, um, to email us for the slides afterwards. Um, or your school, your children may wish to devise their own icons, that's absolutely fine. Um, what you can then do is once you've got those icons up in the classroom, you could actually start to stick um, examples of children's work for those different types of inquiry or you could have pictures of the children doing those different types of inquiry. So there are there as a reference for the children to refer back to. You could add the icons to um, the work in books. Um, the children could draw a simple symbol or you may have them on stickers that get stuck in. You may choose to use to add them to your presentation slides um, so that when, when you're presenting the question, you're discussing the questions, they're there so that the children can refer to them. Um, so just an extra little bit of um, information, a document that you may find useful, and I will just show you where to access this. This is on um, my website, um, and again, the link is there. And what it's got is for each area of the curriculum, it has got some ideas of different inquiry, inquiry questions that might be answered using those different types of inquiry. Um, but what's also important is that it includes where something is not relevant. Children should be engaged in all these types of inquiry through the year. So by the end of the year, I would have expected them to engage in all five, but they wouldn't necessarily do all five of them in each topic. Some topics lend themselves better to one type of inquiry than another. So I will just show you where to access those nice and quickly. I'm just looking at my colleague to see what are you seeing on the screen? Are you seeing my, the website? Okay, the link um, for what? Okay, the link for this document is on the chat, um, but you should, if you go onto my website and you go to the resources section, our resources and the document, you can download it for each year group. Bennett, can you just confirm that you are seeing the, doc, the website? Thank you. Um, so you can download each year group for the teachers or as a subject leader, you can download the whole document. Okay, so um, before we just have our last, I'm just going to give you this last question for discussion, but I'm going to do a quick survey before we go on to the chat for discussion that way. Um, so I just like, I'd be interested if any of you would like to share how you've made those types of inquiry explicit to children, any tips that you've got to offer other teachers. Thank you very much for joining me and hopefully I will um, meet with you again next week. Thank you very much.